to stay home, stay focused. I am Jack Moline, president of Interfaith Alliance. And my special guest today is my friend, Mitch Randall from Good Faith Media. Mitch, uh, the first question we always ask is, how are you doing? Well, Jack, we're doing very well. Uh, in fact, uh, you, were, you and I were visiting off camera just a moment ago. And the last time I think I was in a public space was actually with you in Washington, DC. About six weeks ago, uh, we had dinner together. Uh, and since then, uh, we've been hunkered down here in Norman, Oklahoma is where I live. Uh, we immediately, upon returning from D.C., uh, brought both of my boys home from college. One was in New Hampshire and the other one was out in California. And so my wife had, my wife and I had the distinct pleasure of being empty nesters for three months. And now we are back <laughs> to the full house. Uh, but we're all doing well and very healthy. Thank you. Well, I'm glad to hear that. And uh... Uh, you know, eating in a restaurant is uh, is a luxury that I'd gotten used to, and right, so sure. uh, we shared that that last public meal together. And uh, since that time, I'm just amazed at how much food two people can go through in a house. So I know, right? Yeah, it's remarkable. What What are you doing to keep yourself focused on on things other than washing your hands and keeping your loved ones safe? You know, uh, the one thing about being uh, part of a media company is that uh, we can continue to do our work. Uh, we have a remote office uh, and a mobile office. We have employees all over the country. And um, to just let your audience know, uh, we're part of a merger that's going on right now. And Good Faith Media is uh, the merging of two other companies, Ethics Daily, which I was uh, the executive director of, and Nurturing Faith out of Atlanta, Georgia. And so our mobile office is spans the entire country, and I office out of my house, and uh, most of our material is online. Uh, and so we're able to produce uh, and release, uh, continue to release uh, uh, periodicals every day, columns of which you have been a part of at ethicsdaily.com right now, uh, soon to be goodfaithmedia.org. Uh, so we've been able to focus on our work. We also launched a new podcast, Good Faith Weekly, uh, that you can find on Apple and Spotify or whatever, uh, whatever uh, uh, platform. Uh, yeah, podcast uh, uh, software you use to listen. Uh, but we've been producing Autumn Lockett, uh, who is our executive director for development and marketing. She and I have been hosting it, and uh, uh, we've been producing two podcasts a week, talking to uh, chaplains, physicians, ministers, uh, even had a singer-songwriter from Nashville on the other day. Uh, so really been able to not miss a beat uh, work-wise, uh, but it has been different. Uh, again, having my two adult uh, children living with us, uh, them doing their Zoom classes online wow. daily. Uh, but uh, my son and I go out in the front yard and have a catch about twice a day. Uh, so uh, yeah, it keeps, keeps our sanity. There you go. There you go. So I want to back up a little bit. You've, you've talked a little already about Good Faith Media and mm -hmm. about the two uh, companies that have come together to form it. But uh, both of those companies operated under different names for a long time. Uh, Ethics Daily was ba the Baptist Center for Ethics and Nurturing Faith was Baptists Today. Correct. Can you talk about the evolution of those, of those two entities uh, into a, uh, a less specifically branded uh, approach? Yeah, absolutely. Well, as uh, many of your audience may know, uh, there was uh, quite a bit of tension within the Southern Baptist Convention over 30 years ago. And when moderates and progressive Baptists were pushed out of the Southern Baptist Convention, uh, there was a plethora of organizations that began to emerge about three, 30 years ago. Two of those organizations was Baptist Today, as well as the Baptist Center for Ethics. And Baptist Today was a, uh, a periodical, a printed periodical that came out monthly. Uh, uh, President, uh, former President Carter was a part of the initial launch of Baptist Today, continues to be a supporter of the magazine, even though it's evolved into nurturing faith now. Uh, so it really began to, as a, as a magazine, as a journal, uh, to discuss what was going on within the moderate to Baptist movement and telling stories within congregational life, within denominational life, uh, also talking about some more critical issues. Baptist Center uh, Ethics was similar, uh, but concentrated on ethical issues and creating a theological framework from a, a moderate to progressive Baptist understanding of the world 
how to address some of these more critical issues that we were facing. So my predecessor, Dr. Robert Parham, was the founder of the uh, Baptist Center for Ethics. And Dr. Parham, unfortunately, passed away three years ago of cancer. And uh, I, uh, the, the board, uh, hired me two years to, ago to take care or to, uh, to assume those positions. And I was honored to do so. Over those 30 years, both of our organizations have understood that within Christ the Christian movement, uh, there is uh, some interesting uh, seismic shifts taking place between more conservative denominations and more moder moderate to progressive denominations. And so we were finding ourselves breathing the same air at times, uh, uh, tackling some of the same issues from a Christian perspective. Uh, and we began to realize that our community was uh, beyond the Baptist ecosystem. And so very wisely, both organizations, Baptist Today and Baptist Center for Ethics began to rebrand themselves to be more ecumenical in their, not only their presentation, but with their, within their involvement within the larger Christian family. And so Baptist Today morphed into Nurturing Faith and Baptist Center for Ethics morphed into Ethics Daily. And those are the two organizations that are now coming together uh, to try to even broaden our, uh, our, uh, our community and uh, with good faith media, understanding that not only are there uh, Christians who are addressing these issues in very similar fashions and similar ways, but there are uh, wonderful Jewish community and Muslim community uh, and interfaith community out there that want to address these issues and want to stand beside Christians who think like them and understand that we are trying to advance the common good for all people of faith. And it's, it's probably the case that most people who are not themselves Baptists of some kind of description hear the word Baptist and associate it with Southern Baptists who have a tendency to suck up the oxygen in public conversation. Yeah. Yeah, we've, we've often, and for the last uh, 30 years or so, we have often uh, kind of had a running joke going around our Baptist circles that we needed T-shirts where Baptist butts. <laughs> <laughs> and what I mean by that is everybody would ask, well, you're, ba you're Baptist, right? And I'd say, yeah, I'm Baptist, but I'm <laughs> kind of Baptist youth or, or, or assuming I am. So, uh, so yeah, there is an assumption uh, nationally that when you indicate that you're a Baptist or that you are a Southern Baptist, but the, the Baptist family, like any denomination, really, Jack, and any really faith group is, is so diverse. Right. Uh, and, and unfortunately, uh, sometimes whatever faith, or whatever denomination that uh, you find yourself in, sometimes the, that terminology gets co-opted by the loudest group in, in the family. So you, you yourself have had a journey. Um, you, you were a, uh, a pastor to a variety of congregations as you progressed through your career. And then you made this shift to being full-time in, uh, in good faith media and before that ethics daily. What led you away from, oh, I guess I should ask the first question, what led you to the pulpit and then what led you away from it? Yeah. Well, great question. Um, you know, growing up, I grew up here in, in Oklahoma, a very conservative state, probably the most one of the most conservative states, uh, both politically and theologically uh, in the country. Uh, I grew up as a Southern Baptist, uh, didn't know, you know, much outside of the Southern Baptist life. My parents were young when they had me, uh, took me to church every Sunday. We were involved in a local congregation. As I grew, I was very fortunate to be able to uh, uh, be involved in athletics uh, at a pretty high level uh, here in the state of Oklahoma, as well as playing collegiately uh, after high school. And so I was involved in the Fellowship of Christian Athletes for uh, several years. I uh, was invited by numerous groups to come and share my testimony, talk about my faith and why it was important to me as a baseball player uh, in particular. And each time I did so, whether that was in a Fellowship of Christian Athletes venue or in a local church setting, I got to, to talk uh, in local churches every now and again, uh, people would come up to me and say, you really should consider 
uh, going into the ministry. You have a unique story. You have a gift of sharing, uh, you know, your conscience. Uh, you, know, you just ought to consider it. And so, you know, I, I thought, oh, that's good. But, you know, I still wanted to swing a bat for a living. Uh, and the problem with, with that was that I didn't connect with the ball enough <laughs> to make that a living. <laughs> so They won't just let you swing. You got to hit something. Let, you got to hit something every now and again. That's exactly right. So uh, I began to, to, to kind of just really think about the potential, potential of, of going into the ministry and, and felt I had a calling my senior year of uh, college. Uh, ended up going to Southwestern Seminary in Fort Worth, a Southern Baptist seminary. And while I was there, uh, the president at the time, Dr. Russell Bilday, uh, was still a, uh, the, the seminary was under his leadership. Uh, he was uh, in, he was just a, a very incredible leader. He was important to the, the moderate Baptist movement within the Southern Baptist Convention. Unfortunately, while I was there, the trustees fired him. Uh, and it's a long story that I can tell you and your listeners another time. But okay. they, they locked his doors. They ushered him out as like he was a criminal. It was a horrendous moment. And that rocked my core uh, because uh, I did not know that side of the Southern Baptist Convention up close. And at Southwestern, I witnessed it with my own eyes. Uh, and it was despicable. And uh, a lot of people that I had admired over the years I knew were actually lying about uh, his departure. Uh, so that began uh, a, a long journey for me, trying to discover who I was theologically, who I was going to be as a pastor in a local congregation. And so uh, I ended up leaving seminary after graduating, uh, pastoring churches in Kansas and Texas and eventually in Oklahoma. Uh, loved the local congregation, the church, loved the interaction, the relationships that uh, my family and I connected with within all those congregations. Love the, the concept of preaching, love sitting down each week, wrestling with scripture, uh, and then crafting a sermon to deliver it on a Sunday morning, and just really enjoyed it. And that was going to be uh, my career until the day I retired, until this came along. And the, uh, the board of directors for the Baptist Center for Ethics after the death of Dr. Parham reached out to me because I'd always addressed issues uh, in a very uh, direct way. Uh, I, I did not hold back my convictions, my thoughts when I would write for places like Ethics Daily, and Nurturing Faith, and other organizations. And so they said, you know, we, we really like what you have to say as a pastor. Would you consider uh, being the executive director for Ethics Daily? And I I said, well, I'm not that interested. I love my congregation, but I'm willing to talk to you. And so they brought me to Nashville and we had a great conversation and I was absolutely sold on their vision for the Baptist Center for Ethics. Uh, they said they want to speak prophetically and priestly into this community. They wanted to uh, reach out to other denominational leaders within the Christian faith, as well as be directly involved in interfaith work. And so I said, sign me up. And here I am today. The, the, uh, the head of a media conglomerate. That's right. That's right. Yeah, Mitch, do you miss the, the pulpit? You know, I do. Um, you know, I, 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 like many, many uh, people of faith are having to attend uh, you know, prayers and services and, uh, and temple via online now. And I'm watching these pastors and these rabbis and imams do incredible work. Uh, and as I, I, I can feel their angst, I can feel their worry uh, each week, uh, but they're doing such a good job. But I do miss the day-to-day -day, uh, interaction with the people, the relationships uh, within congregational life. Uh, and and I'm, I miss preaching every week. I do get great opportunities to, to preach across the country, uh, count that as an honor, uh, but it's not every week. I, I do miss that. I do write an article and call them every week for ethicsdaily.com, but it's not the same as putting a, a sermon together. Well, speaking of, of the content of uh, Ethics Daily and Good Faith Media, you're not a, a breaking news website. You're more an observer of the scene. So, in these unusual times, 
how are you covering the uh, the pandemic and the nation's response to it? Yeah, we are very fortunate to have numerous volunteer columnists all around the world, Jack. And what has been amazing to me is to get submissions from clergy and laity and healthcare workers and scientists that are giving an overall comprehensive view of what's going on globally around the world. But in doing so, they're giving some really practical advice, but at the same time, they are helping create this theological framework for us to interpret what's going on in the world, how to understand it, and also how to react to it. We've also put a lot of emphasis on spiritual and mental health. Uh, we're hearing from people, again, across the world who are facing now their sixth to seventh week uh, in quarantine. And that takes a toll on, on families. It takes a toll on individuals. And so we've been talking to therapists and chaplains and clergy trying to uh, help our listeners, our readers, uh, through columns, through our podcast, uh, try to cope with isolation, uh, with depression, uh, with heightened anxiety and heightened stress. Uh, you've seen the statistics as well as I have uh, that uh, the increase in domestic violence has gone up. Tensions in households are you know, boiling over, unfortunately. And we're trying to uh, empower and give the tools to our listeners and readers on how to cope with that, recognize those signals, signals before uh, they become uh, overwhelming and, and are let loose within a, a very tight setting. So we are covering it in a variety of ways, but we're very fortunate to have a large community to help us do so. You and I both know, evangelicals in our own way, mm -hmm. that there's a large mission field of people out there who are not particularly interested in formalized religion or may not even profess a belief of any kind, right. uh, even with the catchphrase spiritual. Sure. Does, does good faith media have something for those folks as well? We certainly hope so, Jack. Uh, we understand that we live in a global community that is filled with a, a, a diverse population. Some of those people consider themselves people of faith. There are some people uh, and a growing amount of people who consider themselves a, a, a person of non-faith, uh, the nons, if you will. And we see that through uh, research growing each and every year. Uh, but they also understand that religion and faith play a prominent role in society uh, and that there is uh, good teachings and good philosophies and good practices that can come out of the faith tradition that can help a person who may not actually practice a week-to-week -week faith. Uh, and there is some overlap, and, and I hope that my fellow uh, citizens and, and uh, that even don't, pra that don't practice faith uh, would listen to some of the counselors that we have, uh, because it's, it is really practical information that can help them uh, in their day-to-day -day life. That's great. I, I want to ask you something that's a little off topic yeah, uh, sure. for this discussion, but very much on topic for us. Uh, both Good Faith Media and Interfaith Alliance uh, have benefited greatly from the generosity of the Ulame and John Baugh Foundation. Yeah. I, I wonder if you might say a, a few words about the nature of that generosity. It's relevant not only to you as a Christian and me as a Jew, but we've just entered into Ramadan where generosity is also an, a, an important value. Yeah, the John, uh, the Udall May and John Ball uh, Foundation uh, is incredibly generous with their resources. Uh, for your viewers who may not know the Ball family, uh, John Ball and Eula May uh, were, and John more, more specifically, was the founder of Cisco Food Systems across the country. So when you see a Cisco truck going down the highway, uh, thank the Lord because of their generosity, uh, our two organizations have benefited along with many other organizations around the world. Um, 
John and Yula Mae have, have uh, passed uh, over the last decade. Uh, and now their daughter, Babs Ball, is the president of the foundation. And, uh, and Babs' two daughters, uh, Jackie and Julie, are vice presidents. Uh, they are involved in numerous ways regarding faith, but in particular, uh, they see the importance of not only interfaith dialogue, but interfaith uh, partnerships and collaboration. And that is the genius and the beauty behind the Ba's generosity. Uh, when they came to us and, and with the idea of collaborating within other Baptist organizations to, with the possibility of creating good faith media, part of that conversation was that we, while we are uniquely Christian, also want to broaden our relationships and collaboration with other people of faith. And the balls have led the way in that effort. And I cannot, as well as you, cannot thank them enough for their leadership and their vision uh, and willingness to put their resources where their ideas are. Well, I'm, I'm glad that you're being on this, this webcast gave me the opportunity to raise that question because right. both of us feel exactly the same way. Yeah. We have reached the end of our time, which is hard to believe this has been so delightful. So I want to ask you the question I ask everybody at the end of the podcast, yeah. uh, of the uh, webcast, Mitch. And that is, if you could suggest one thing to, ins to help people become inspired and engaged as they're sequestered during this quarantine time, what would it be? I would say look at your local communities. That's one of the things that I have been inspired by uh, recently. Uh, we can be, it, it can become daunting when you look at national news and uh, you, you watch what's coming out of Washington, D.C. on occasion and, and potential gridlock. They are coming together to, to help on occasions, uh, but look locally uh, and see what's happening in your local townships, in your cities, your municipalities. Uh, for example, here in Norman, citizens have come together to help create masks for healthcare workers, uh, local companies uh, shutting down production to begin produce uh, protective gear, uh, trying to encourage our local healthcare workers any way we can, but look locally, think globally, but act locally. Uh, is what I would tell your viewers, because there's some great, great things happening in townships all across this country. Mitch Randall, thank you so much for being with me today. Uh, I thank you for being here, and my apologies to all of you if uh, if you had a little dose of the folks who cut our lawn who managed to show up <laughs> just as we were beginning this webcast. But uh, to all of you, uh, stay home, stay focused.